My name is Paul Spears and this is my Analyzing Creativity video submission. So the basis of my presentation will be on the book Flow and the Psychology of Discovery and Invention using the system of commitment and anticipation. I will also touch on the systems model of creativity. The systems model comprises of three parts, domain, field and individual. The domain, uh, for example, uh, it could be maths, biology, or in this case, music. It consists of a set of symbols, rules, and procedures. The second part of the field is the individuals who act as gatekeepers to that domain, decide whether a new idea, performance, or product should be included. And finally, the third part is the individual. And creativity is when a person has a new idea or sees a new pattern. And when this novelty is selected by the appropriate field, it's included in the relevant domain. So the methodology for my presentation will be using the qualitative research method, using primary and secondary sources. The reasons being are qualitative means that it refers to the data that provides insight and understanding about a particular issue. And the issue that is being raised in my presentation is the production techniques that have been used during Nile Rogers' career. When reg with regards to primary and secondary sources, I've already identified the book Flow and the Psychology of Discovery and Invention as a first-hand account of the system model that will be relating to my analysis. And finally, secondary, I've found many interviews in which Nile Rogers has been a part of and I will, will give me an in-depth analysis of how he defines his creativity. Chex and Mali suggest that we only recognise this person's creativity when this novelty is selected by the gatekeepers for inclusion into the relevant domain. If we mean an idea or action that is new and valuable, then we cannot simply accept a person's own account as the standard for its existence. Another way to define creativity is by a process by which a symbolic domain and the culture is changed, but because these changes don't happen automatically, as in biological evolution, it is necessary to consider the price we must pay for creativity to occur. It takes the effort to change traditions. For example, a musician must learn the music tradition, the notation system, the way instruments are played before they can think of writing a new song. There are many different theories of creativity, and in the book, The Flow, we'll refer to from now on, there is a chapter on the work of creativity. There are many theories, as I've said, on creativity. For one, Robert Galvin says that creativity consists of anticipation and commitment. Anticipation involves having a vision of something that will become important in the future before anyone else has it. Commitment is the belief that keeps one working to realise the vision despite doubt and discouragement. The flow of creativity. It means creative persons differ from one another in a variety of ways, but in one respect they are unanimous. They all love what they do. It is not the hope of achieving fame or making money that drives them. Rather, it is the opportunity to do work that they enjoy doing. So this brings me to Niall Rogers. So the creative text, I'll be looking at the presentation, as I've said, is his production techniques. And specifically looking at one, in my opinion, is the greatest songs in disco, Le Freak. I will also be analysing the production techniques he has used in different genres, particularly in his version of David Bowie's Let's Dance. Why am I looking at Niall Rogers? It is because he has been responsible for some of the greatest hits over the last 40 years. He has worked with the likes of David Bowie, Madonna, Daft Punk, Avicii, Disclosure, Sam Smith, selling over 200 million albums, 50 million singles, and his guitar, known as The Hitmaker, has reportedly made over $2 billion in revenue. His Production techniques deserve recognition because, being innovative and sometimes futuristic, he has also been involved in countless collaborations, some we have never heard of and some we definitely have. Niall has been involved in music for four decades, starting with Sheik's first studio album in 1977 
and since then has been involved in 2,850 productions as a composer, producer, engineer, arranger and artist to name but a few of his many hats. Nile Rodgers is one of the few black producers to achieve creative and commercial success across multiple genres and decades, but the scope of his contribution rarely attracts detailed analysis despite an enduring influence, and that is the reason why I'm looking into him for this analysis presentation. Nile Rodgers operates as a highly involved hands-on producer whose musical awareness heavily informs his production consciousness. In an article back in 2016, he identified the reason why he has never stopped in the music industry, and I quote, I write every night. During his doc, Ro Roger spoke about how much time he has put into his music, and he said, The good thing about my life is I don't sleep very much, normally around three hours a night, so I'm always creating, he explained. I learned from the composer Ennio Morricone, who is a famous musician and composer. Ennio told Nile he composes every day, even if it's rubbish, because he wants to make his brain write music. Ennio said, even if you write every night and it's thanks the next morning, it will inspire you and make your brain work. Later in the analysis, I will identify how this way of life has affected his career. Nile Rodgers has always talked about his creativity. In an interview, he said, in people, while people think often think of making music as a serendipitous process, hooks, lyrics, or verses thought up in moments of inspiration, now Rogers described songwriting as a careful act of editing, rewriting, and reworking. He said that he will often produce up to 20 or 25 versions of a song before it's ready to be released. Which brings me to the part of analysis the analysis part of Niall's work. In an article in 2007, Niall said that the main characteristics of his work rely heavily on the bass and the bass drum, which he stated that are an integral part of the foundation of the compo compositions and arrangements that he has been involved in. The stronger the foundation, the more artistic freedom you have. If the bottom is strong, and the foundation is solid, it will support a larger structure. So it's almost like a law of physics. This is a huge feature of this. A huge feature of this is the creativity in which he uses the recording studio as an instrument and has allowed him to scope for, you know, moments of spont spontaneous. Tony Visconti, who was David... Bowie's producer said that Nile would use few instruments but make a, them sound really important. If you listen to Sheik's records, the drum and bass were great and he had that funky guitar and backing vocals and there was little else. So uh, when looking at this, you know, it, it is clear through all of his work that the amount he spends in music is really paid off and like that bit. So, the song I'm going to be looking at is Le Freak, which was the band's third single, a part of their 1978 album, C'est Chic. It was released on the 18th of November 1978, which at the time disco was at its height, and so the song got to number one in the United States, but only number seven in the UK charts. It was the best-selling record on Atlantic Records, selling more than 10 million and counting and one which seems to get remixed, re-released every few months. It is perversely the song most closely associated with the group. It's been described as a knees-up, do-the-conga floor filler, whose original lyric was rather less friendly. We'll be talking about that in the next slide. In an interview, Niall explained the origin of the song. It was late 1977, and Grace Jones wanted Niall to produce her next record. So Bernard Edwards and Nile Rodgers went to see her backstage at Studio 54, a huge, which was a huge club in New York, where they played Everybody Dance and Dance, Dance, Dance all the time. And these were really big songs, so it was obviously dominated their career. 
but the bouncers at the door that night wouldn't let the band in. So they went back to Nell's apartment and it was snowing, so they started to jam. And they came up with this line, Ah, fuck you! In Neil Rogers' autobiography, he said that it was horrible, but they tried their best to make it work. Suddenly, the proverbial light bulb went off, and, ne and Bernard Edwards said, Hey man, we should say, ah, oh, freak out. And Neil said, freak out? Then he said, yeah, it was like when you have a bad trip, you freak out. This wasn't the best reference for Bernard or Bernie Edwards, as he had just took LSD at the time. The phrase worked rhythmically, and it supplied a reference to the freak, which was a style of dance that people performed at, at Studio 54, combined with a strong rhythmic phrasing landing on the first beat of the bar for out. The lyrics are an important part to the rhythmic phrasing of the hook. Even though they don't necessarily make much sense, the words are as important as vocal sounds. One of the big characteristics of Niles' playing techniques during a song is his guitar style, which was a result from the, of instruction from Bernie himself. It was described as a chucking rhythm style combined with Roger's jazz chops resulted in a unique approach towards the instrument. In an interview described how in an interview, Niall described how the track was recorded. The rhythm track was always played completely live, without a click track, and they'd select one particular take. No no song that they ever recorded was compiled from different takes. We knew which take it was because it was the one we kept. And then we'd overdub onto that. There are no alternative takes on anything. If we play it weren't satisfied with a take, it wouldn't go live. They'd make up their minds right there on the spot. They'd listen to it. And then they would go, oh, that was good. And that would be the one they would eventually release. After this, Bernie and his attorney, Bernie and his lawyer took the finished album to the record label, to the record label. And by the time the song ended, after about seven and a half minutes, which was the song's length at that time, they'd cleared out the entire conference room. They were just sitting there by themselves, Bernie and the and their lawyer. Everyone else was outside trying to think out how to tell the band how much the song sucked and wondered did they have anything else on the album that was better. As I said during the introduction, I would relate the story to the theory I have identified with this song. Commitment is the belief that keeps one working to realise the vision despite doubt and discouragement. And somehow the label would later get on board with Niall and his band and release the record. As I have said, it remains to be the biggest selling record on Atlantic's label. The band would go on to releasing another five albums with the label before breaking up, allowing Niall to expand his creativity into production work. Which brings me to the next part of this analysis, where Niall Rogers met David Bowie. Let's Dance reveals another side of Rogers' work. At the time, the collaboration came to be both Bowie and Rogers found themselves in pivotal points in their respective careers. In an interview, Niall and David said that they got together, they spent two weeks researching music styles, and Bowie suddenly said, I got it. He held up a little Richard album cover where he's wearing a red suit and got into a red Cadillac with a pompadour haircut and said, that's rock and roll. After doing all that research with him, Niall got it too and Niall knew instantly what he wanted for the album. As producers progress, they also absorb influences along the way. Besides this, advances in technologies have a, an effect on how producers work to varying degrees with Niall Rogers, an observation that can be made is that he adopts technology in a way that is specific to him. His background as a band musician through his formative years as a musician greatly influences his work as a producer. In a masterclass in Montreal, Rogers explained how he approached the raw material supplied to him by Bowie. 
It consists, this consisted of strum chords through a chord change con consisting of an A minor chord moving to an F major. Rogers explained he, how he first changed the key up a semitone to make the guitar part sound overall brighter, pointing out the quirks of his guitar as the reason for this. Comparing the production of Let's Dance with previous productions by Nile Rogers, the most striking difference in comparison to Sheik, Sister Sledge or Diana Ross is his more pronounced use of effects. Bowie even described this song as a postmodern homage to Twist and Trout, which was a big song by the Isley Brothers. So this brings me to the song analysis. Obviously, the guitar considerations are a big part of the song. In this instance, the guitar becomes a vital piece of technology in the process of sculpting the sound of a recording. This, to me, sounds as an example of how the technology used contributes to the creative process in what could be described as an integrated way where the interface between user and technology influence the music outcome. This brings me to the production, where the guitar is distinctly treated with a panned echo. What means is that this means that the dry original sound of the guitar is placed to one side of the stereo image, while the wet part affected signal is placed on the opposing side to bring a more stereo sound to your ears. Obviously I've said the drum and the was a big part of Niall's creative you know creation uh, along with a lot of his work but within the context of the Sheik the use of drum machines can be heard clearly on the title track of their album Believer replacing the grooves of Tony Thompson with program beats yields a notable difference in the overall sound of the ensemble listening to the intro the hi-hat can be heard bouncing from side to side this is the same effect that is held on Let's Dance except applied to drums. Producing David Bowie's Let's Dance, Nile Rogers had to overcome the considerable post-disco prejudice which still lingered in the industry and the recurrent implication that collaboration between himself and Bowie was artistically incompatible. However, Tony Visconti, who, as I said, is our early Bowie's producer, explains the way he sees creative affinity. David Bowie wanted a kind of sparse, economical sound that Niall could do, which was really the opposite way to which, you know, Tony Visconti and David Bowie worked. So, in an interview, he said he was absolutely right to choose Niall for that because... Tony Visconti wouldn't have done that. One of the key features of Roger's sound is the use of his guitar, which has crossed over from his early works working, working with Sheik to his newest productions, working with the likes of Avicii, Sam Smith, Disclosure. But since I don't have the time to go through his entire career, which, believe me, would take a lot more than 20 minutes, I will say this. Despite doubt and discouragement, he has retained creative control with his unique guitar playing, giving him a remarkable career. To be one of only a few black producers that has been able to cross genres in decades and still remain artistic integrity and persist a benchmark for quality music, Niall Rogers deserves special recognition. And then uh, this is the reason I chose to analyse his work during this presentation. So for the end questions uh, for, of why I used a particular model of creativity. When analysing creativity, I found that there were so many similarities between the theory of field, domain, person, anticipation and commitment that even at a basic level, music can be incorporated into the theory. And when I read the book Flow and the Psychology of Discovery and Invention, this furthered my belief that it was the right theory to incorporate. Why did I choose Nile Rodgers? I've always loved Nile Rodgers' music, and in the initial stages of research, I realised there wasn't a lot of academic research on his music, and I felt it deserved recognition. 
for all the music he has been involved in. Here are my references. <laughs> 